if we look back 10, 15 years ago, you see the the communication community is more diverse. You see all kinds of machine learning methods. You see all kinds of knowledge is borrowed from physics, from optical field, all getting into this field to try to tackle the problem from multi-perspective. As we are emphasizing diversity everywhere, I think the scientific community is going to be more healthy if we have diverse perspective. You're listening to the Microsoft Research Podcast, a show that brings you closer to the cutting edge of technology research and the scientists behind it. I'm your host, Gretchen Huizinga. In technical terms, computer vision researchers build algorithms and systems to automatically analyze imagery and extract knowledge from the visual world. In layman's terms, they build machines that can see. And that's exactly what principal researcher and research manager Dr. Gang Hua and the computer vision technology team are doing. Because being able to see is really important for things like the personal robots, self-driving cars, and autonomous drones we're seeing more and more in our daily lives. Today, Dr. Hua talks about how the latest advances in AI and machine learning are making big improvements on image recognition, video understanding, and even the arts. He also explains the distributed ensemble approach to active learning, where humans and machines work together in the lab to get computer vision systems ready to see and interpret the open world. That and much more on this episode of the Microsoft Research Podcast. Gang Hua. Hi. Hello. Welcome <laughs> to the podcast. Great to have you here. Thanks for inviting me. You're a principal researcher and the research manager at MSR, and your focus is computer vision research. Mm -hmm. In broad strokes right now, what gets a computer vision researcher up in the morning? What's the big goal? Yeah, computer vision is a relatively young research field. In general, you can think this field is trying to build machines to endow computers the capability to just see the world and interpret the world just like human. From a more technical side of view, it's the input to the computer is really just the image and the videos. You can think uh, of them as a sequence of numbers. But uh, what we want to extract from these images and videos from these numbers is some sort of structures of the world or some semantic information out of it. For example, I could see this part of the image really corresponds to a cat. That part of the image corresponds to a car, this type of interpretation. So that's the goal of communication. Like for us humans, it looks to be a simple task to achieve. But uh, in order to teach computers to do it, we really have made a lot of progress in the past 10 years. But as a research field, this thing has been there for 50 years. Still yet a lot of problems to tackle and address. Yeah, in <laughs> fact, um, you gave a talk about five years ago uh -huh. where you said, and I paraphrase, after 30 years of research, why should we still care about face recognition research? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how you answered then and now where you think we are. So I think that's a status quo five years ago. I would say like at that moment, if we capture a snapshot of how the research in facial recognition has progressed, since the beginning of computer vision or face recognition research, I would say we achieved a lot, but more in controlled environment where you could carefully control the lighting, the camera setting, and uh, all those kind of things when you are framing the faces. At that moment, five years ago, when we moved towards more like wild settings, like faces taking on the uncontrolled environment, I would say there's a huge gap there yeah. in terms of recognition accuracy. But uh, in the past five years, I would say the whole community also made a lot of progress leveraging like, the more advanced the deep learning techniques. Even for facial recognition in the wild scenario, we've made a lot of progress and really have pushed these things to a stage where a lot of commercial applications mm -hmm. becomes feasible to okay. do. Yeah. So deep learning has really enabled, even recently, mm -hmm. some great advances in the field of computer vision mm -hmm. and computer recognition of images. Right. So that's interesting when you talk about the difference between a highly controlled situation yep. versus recognizing things in the wild. And I've had a couple of researchers on here who have said, yeah, where computers fail is when the data sets are not full enough, for example, mm -hmm. dog, 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 three-legged dog, 
mm, is it still a dog? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. So what kinds of things do deep learning techniques give you that you didn't have before in these recognition advances? Yeah, that's a great question. From a research perspective, you know, the power of deep learning resides in several facts. The first thing is that it can conduct the learning in an end-to-end -end fashion and uh, learn what's the right representation for that semantic pattern. For example, when we're talking about a, a dog, if we really look into all kinds of pictures of a dog, although, see, if my input is really a 64 by 64 images, suppose each pixel has like 250 values to take, that's a huge space if you right. think about it combinatorally. But when we talk about dog as a pattern, like actually every pixel is correlated a little bit. So the actual pattern for dog is going to reside in a, a much lower dimensional space. Right. So the power of deep learning is that I can conduct the learning in an end-to-end fashion and really learn the right numerical representation for dog. And because of the deep structures, we can come out with really complicated models which can really digest a large amount of training data. Yeah. So that means like uh, if my training data covered all kinds of variations, like all kinds of views of this pattern, eventually I can recognize it in a broader setting because I have covered almost all the spaces. Okay. Right. So another uh, capability of deep learning is that this kind of compositional behavior, because it's a layer, a feed forward structure and a layered representation there. So when the information or image get the feed into deep networks and it starts by extracting some very low level image primitives, then gradually the model can assemble all those primitives together and form uh, higher and higher level or semantic structures. So in this sense, it captures all the small patterns corresponding to the bigger patterns and compose them together to represent the final pattern. So that's why it is very powerful, especially for visual recognition tasks. Right. So, yeah. So the broad umbrella of mm -hmm. CVPR yes. is computer vision pattern recognition. Right. And a lot of that pattern recognition is what the techniques are really driving to. Sure, yeah. Okay. So that's actually, computer vision really is trying to make sense out of pixels. If we talk about it in a really mechanical way, is that I fit in the image, you either extract some numerical output or some symbolic output from it. The numerical output, for example, could be a 3D point cloud, which describes the structure yeah. of the scene or the shape of an object. It could also be corresponding to some semantic labels like dog and uh, cat, as I mentioned at the beginning. Right. So, yeah. so we'll get to labeling in a bit. Sure. Um, it's an interesting <laughs> whole part of the machine learning process is that it mm -hmm. has to be fed labels as well as pixels. Sure. Right? <laughs> yeah. You have three main areas of interest in your computer vision research that we mm -hmm. talked about. Video, faces, and arts and media. Let's talk about each of those in turn and start with your current research in what you call video understanding. Yes. Video understanding, like uh, the title sort of explains itself. Instead of uh, the input allow becomes a video stream. Instead of a single image, we're reasoning about pixels and how they move. If we view computation reasoning about the single images as a spatial reasoning problem, now we are talking about a spatial temporal reasoning problem because uh, video is the third dimension right. or the temporal dimension. And if you look into a lot of real world uh, problem, we are talking about continuous video streams, sure. whether it is a surveillance camera in a building or a traffic camera overseeing highways. You have this constant flow of frames coming in and uh, the object inside it is moving, so you want to basically digest information out of it. When you talk about those kinds of cameras, mm -hmm. it gives us massive amounts of video, you know, constant stream of cameras and security in the 7-Eleven and things like that. What is your group trying to do on behalf of humans with those video streams? Sure. So one incubation project we are doing, like my team is building the foundational technology there. One incubation project we're trying to do is to really analyze the traffic mm. on roads. If you think about a city, when they set up all those traffic cameras, most of the video streams are actually wasted. But if you carefully think about it, these cameras are smart. Just think about one scenario where 
you want to more intelligently control the traffic lights. Uh-huh. So if in one direction I saw a lot more traffic flow, instead of having a fixed schedule of turn on and turn off those red lights and the green lights, I could see like, okay, because these lights has less cars or even no cars at this moment, right. I would allow the other direction, the green lights to keep a longer time so that the traffic can flow better. So that's just the one type of application there. Could you please <laughs> get that out there? I <laughs> sure. mean, it's, yeah, because how many of us have sat at a traffic light when it's red mm-hmm. and there's no traffic coming the other way? Exactly. At all. It's <laughs> like, why can't I go? Yeah, you, you could also think about some other applications, like if we accumulated videos across years, if there's citizens requesting, like we set up uh, additional bicycle lanes, Right. We could use the videos we have, analyzing all the traffic data there, and then decide if it makes sense to set up a bike lane there. If we set it, will it sort of significantly affect the other traffic flows and help the cities to make decisions like that? I think this is so brilliant because a lot of times we make decisions based on, you know, our own ideas rather than data that right. says, you know, hey, this is where a bike lane would be terrific. This is where it would actually ruin everything for everybody, right? For sure, yeah. So. They sometimes they leverage just some other type of sensors to do that. Usually sure. you hire a company, like set up some special equipments on the roads to do that. But it's very costly and effective. Just thinking about it, all those cameras are sitting there, the video streams are there. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so that's a fantastic explanation of what you can do with machine learning and video understanding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Another area you care about is faces and kind of harkens back to the why should we still care about uh-huh. facial recognition research. Sure. But yeah. Um, and this line of research has some really interesting applications. Talk about what's happening with facial recognition research. <laughs> Who's doing it and what's new? Yeah. So... Indeed, uh, if we look back, uh, facial recognition technologies progressed in Microsoft. I think that uh, when I was at Live Labs Research, we set up the first facial recognition library, which could be leveraged by different product teams. Indeed, the first adopter is Xbox. They tried to use facial recognition technology for automatically user login at that moment. I think that's the first adoption. Over the time, like a facial recognition research the center sort of migrated to Microsoft Research Asia, where we still have a group of researchers I collaborate with. We are continuously trying to push the state of the art out. This is a more become a synergistic effort where we have engineering teams helping us to gather more data, and then we just train better models. Our research recently actually focused more on a line of research we call identity preserving mm-hmm. face synthesis. So. Recently, there is a big advancement in deep learning community too, which is the establishment of using deep networks to generative models, which can model the distribution of images so that you can draw from that distribution, basically synthesize the image. You build mm-hmm. a deep networks, which the output is an image yeah. indeed. So uh, what we want to achieve is actually a step further. We want to synthesize faces. Well, we want to keep the identity of those faces seen. We don't want our algorithms to just randomly sample a set of face out without any semantic information. Say you want to generate a face of Brad Pitt, I want to really generate a face looks like Brad Pitt. If I want to generate a face similar to anybody I know, I think we just want to be able to achieve that. So the identity preservation is the sort of outcome that you're aiming for of the person that you're trying to generate the face of. Right. You know, tangentially, I wonder if you get this technology going, does it morph with you as you get older and start to recognize your, or do you have to keep updating your face? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's indeed a very good question. I, I would say in general, we actually have some ongoing research trying to tackle that problem. I think the, for existing technology, yes, you need to update your face maybe from time to time, sure. especially if you under done a lot of changes. For right. example, somebody could have done some plastic surgery. Yeah. <laughs> that, that will basically break out the, the current Wait system. Wait a minute, that's not you. <laughs> sure, no, not me at all. <laughs> so uh, there are several ways you can think about it. Like uh, human faces actually don't change much no. like uh, between age 17, 18, when, when you grow up, uh, all the way to maybe 50-ish. Mm-hmm. They don't change much. So when... Uh, People first go to born, like uh, kids, sure. their, their face actually changes a, changes a lot because there's uh, 
uh, growing in bones and basically the shape and the skin could change a lot. But once people get matured into adult stage, the change is very slow. Sure. So we actually have some research we are trying to model the aging process too that will help establish better facial recognition system across the age. This is actually a very good kind of technology which can allow you to get into the law in re reinforcement domain. For example, some missing kids, uh, oh, they wow. could have been kidnapped by somebody, but after many years, if you... They look different. Yeah, they look different if the smart facial recognition algorithms can match the original photos and the, you may and be say able to what they would look like at maybe 14 if they were kidnapped earlier or yes something. yes exactly wow yeah. that's yeah. a great application yeah. of that so well let's talk about the other area that you're actively pursuing and that's mm -hmm. media and the arts mm -hmm. tell us how research is overlapping with art and particularly what with your work in deep artistic style transfer sure if we look into people's desire right first we need to uh, eat and we need to drink and we need to sleep <laughs> okay then once all these tasks are fulfilled actually we human has a strong design of arts like and creation uh, and the creation yeah. and things like that so this theme of uh, research and communication if we link it to like a more artistic type of what we call media and arts like mm -hmm. basically using communication technologies to give people a good artistic uh, enjoyment mm -hmm. so the particular research project we have done in the past two years is a sequence of algorithms where we can uh, render an image into any sort of artistic styles you want, as long as you provide an example of that artistic style. For example, we can render an image to Van Gogh's style. Van Gogh. Or, yeah. Or any other uh, painter's painting Renoir, style. Monet, yeah. Yeah. Or all Picasso. Those. Yeah. All of them, <laughs> if you can think of Interesting. Like that. Yeah. With Pixels. With pixels, yeah. yeah. Those are all, again, like uh, all done by deep networks and uh, some deep learning technologies we designed. It sounds like you need a lot of disciplines to feed into this research. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you getting all of your talent from in terms of... Uh, in a sense, uh, I would say our goal on this is making, you know, artworks are a lot less necessarily accessible to everyone. Yeah. Like uh, some of these artworks are really expensive. Yeah. By this kind of digital technology, what we are trying to do is make this kind of artworks to be accessible to common users. It. Yeah, democratize it, as you mentioned. Yeah, like, uh, so our algorithm allows us to build the explicit representation, mm -hmm. like a numerical representation for each kind of style. Then... If you want to create new styles, we can blend them. So that is like we are building an art space where we can explore in between to see mm. how this visual effects is evolving between like two painters and things mm -hmm. like that, and even have deeper understanding how they compose their artistic style and things like that. Yeah. What's really interesting to me is that this is a really quantitative field, computer science mm -hmm. algorithms, and sure. a lot of math and numbers. And then you've got art over here, which is much more metaphysical. Sure. <laughs> and yet you're bringing them together and it's revealing the artistic side uh -huh. of the quantitative brain. Sure. I think to bring all these things together, the biggest tool we are leveraging indeed is uh, statistics. Like uh, as, as all kinds of machine learning algorithms are dealing with, it's really trying to capture the statistics of the pixels. get a little technical. We have been a little technical, but let's sure. get a little more technical. <laughs> sure. uh, some of your recently published work, and our listeners can find that on both mm -hmm. the MSR website and your website. Sure. You talked about a new distributed ensemble approach to active learning. Uh -huh. Tell us what's different about that, what you propose, how it's different, what does it promise? Yeah, that's indeed a great question. I think uh, when we are talking about the active learning, we are referring to a process where we have some sort of human oracle involved in the learning process. Uh, in traditional active learning, we, we are seeing that uh, I have a learning machine. This learning machine can intelligently pick up some data samples and ask the human oracle to provide a little bit more input. So the learning machine actually picks a samples and uh, asks if the human oracle actually provide, for example, a label for okay. this image. So in this work, when we're talking about the ensemble machine, we are actually dealing with a more complicated problem. We are trying to factor active learning into actually uh, in a crowdsourcing environment. If you think about the Amazon Mechanical Turk, nowadays it's really 
one of the biggest platform where people send their data and ask the crowd workers to label all of them. But in this process, if you are not careful, the labels you connected from this process for your data could be quite lousy. Indeed. Right. Yeah, they may not be able to be used by you. So, so in this process, we actually try to achieve two goals there. The first goal, we want to smartly distribute the data so that we can make the label to be most uh, cost effective. Okay. The second is that we want to actually assess the quality of all my crowd workers so that maybe even in the online process, I can purposely send my data to the good workers to label. So mm. that's how our model works. So uh, actually, we have an ensemble model distributed one. Like uh, each crowd worker corresponds to one of these uh, learning machines. And uh, we try to do a statistical check across all the models so that in the same process, we actually comes out with a quality score for each of the crowd workers on the fly ah, okay. so that we can use the model to not only select the samples, but also send the data to the labelers with the highest quality to label them. That right. way, with the progress of these label efforts, I can quickly come out with a good model. That leads me to the human in the loop issue mm-hmm. and the necessity of the checks and balances between humans and machines. Uh-huh. Aside from, from what you're just talking about, sure. how are you tackling other issues of quality control by using humans with your machines? I have been thinking about this problem for a while, mainly in the context of robotics. If you think about any intelligent system, I would say, unless you are in a really close world setting, then you may have a system which can run fully autonomously. But whenever we hit the open world, like a current machine learning, uh, machine learning based intelligent system are not necessarily good in dealing with all kinds of open world cases because there's color cases which you may have a lot being covered. And so, variables that you don't think about. Yeah. Exactly. So one thing I have been thinking is that how could we really engage human in that loop to not only help the intelligent agent when they lead it and also at the same time forming some mechanism which we can teach this agent to be able to handle similar situations in the future. I will give you a very specific example. When I was at Stevens Institute of Technology, I had a project from NIH, which is a, we, we call it co robots. It's a, it's what a, kind of robots? Co robots is is actually oh. a wheelchair robots. The idea is that as long as the user can move their leg, we actually have a head mounted camera, which the user can move their head. We use the head mounted camera actually to track the pose of the head and uh, let the users to be able to control the wheelchair robots indeed. Mm -hmm. But we don't want the user to control it all the time. So our goal is actually say, if in a home setting, we want these wheelchair robots to be able to carry the user and move largely autonomously inside the room. Whenever the user gave a guidance, hey, I want to go to my room, then the wheelchair robots would mostly do autonomous navigation. But if the robots sort of encounter a situation does not know how to deal with it, for example, how to move around, then at that moment, we're going to ask the robots to proactively ask the human for control. Then the users will control the robots and uh, deal with that situation. Maybe next time these robots encounter a similar situation, they're going to be able to deal with it again. What were you doing before you came here, and how did you end up at Microsoft Research? This is my second term in Microsoft. So as I mentioned, the first term is between like 2006 and 2009 when I was in a lab called Live Lab Labs. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's my first term. Uh, during that tenure, I established the first uh, face recognition library. Then I kind of uh, got attracted by external world a little bit. So I went to Nokia Research, IBM Research, and... Uh, I landed at the Stevens Institute of Technology as a faculty member there. So, And that's over in New Jersey, right? Yeah, that's in New Jersey, okay. in the East Coast. And wow. uh, <laughs> Then in 2015, I come back to Microsoft Research, but in the Beijing lab first. I, okay. I transferred back actually in 2017 because my family stayed here. <laughs> so, so now you are here in Redmond after mm-hmm. Beijing. How did that move happen? 
My family always stayed in Seattle. Yeah. So Microsoft Research Beijing Lab is a great place. I yeah. would say like uh, I really enjoyed it. One of the unique thing there is the super super dynamic research intern program. So year round there's several hundred intern actually works in the lab and uh, they collaborate closely with their mentor. I think it's a really dynamic environment there. But I because my family is in Seattle, so I sort of explored a little bit and. Uh, then the intelligent group is setting up this communication group there, so that's why I joined. <laughs> Back in Seattle again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I ask this question of all the researchers that come on the podcast, and I'll ask you too: mm -hmm. Is there anything about your work mm -hmm. that uh, we should be concerned about? What I say is anything that keeps you up at night. I would say uh, when we talk about the, com especially in the communication domain, I think um, privacy is potentially the largest concern. If now you look into all countries, there are hundreds of millions of cameras are set up everywhere in public domain or in buildings. And uh, those, I would say, like uh, with the technology advancement, it is really a lot uh, sci-fi to expect that cameras can now really track people all the time. I mean, everything has two sides, I would say. Sure. Yeah, this on one hand could help us, so for example, to better dealing with uh, criminals. But for ordinary citizens, like uh, there's a lot of privacy concerns in this. So what kinds of things, and this is why I asked this question, because mm -hmm. it prompts people to think, okay, I have this power mm -hmm. because of this great technology. Uh -huh. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so um, what kinds of things can we be thinking about and instituting or implementing mm -hmm. to not have that problem. Microsoft has a big effort on GDPR. Yeah. And uh, I think that's great because this is a mechanism to ensure everything we produce actually got aligned with certain regulation. On the other hand, everything needs to strike for a balance between usability and the security or privacy. Sure. If you think about it, like you use some online services, like your activities basically leave traces there. Sure. That's how it is used to better serve you for the future. But if you want to be more convenient, sometimes you need to give up a little bit of information out, but you don't want to give all your information out, right? I think the, the, the boundary is actually a lot of black and white. No. We simply need to carefully control that so that we just get the right amount of information to serve the customer better. but lot the unneeded information or information that the users are a lot comfortable or right. feeling well to So it give seems up. like there's a trend towards permissions and agency mm -hmm. of the user sure. to say, I'm comfortable with this, but I'm not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Right. As we finish up here, mm -hmm. Gang, talk about what you see on the horizon for the next generation of computer vision researchers. What are the big unsolved problems? that might prompt exciting breakthroughs or just be the grind for the next 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question and also a very big question. There are big problems we actually should tackle. If you think about like uh, low communication really leverage uh, statistical machine learning a lot, we can train recognition models, uh, which achieved great results. But that process is largely still appearance-based. So we need uh, to better getting some of the fundamentals in communication, which is 3D geometry, into the perception process, okay. And there's also other things, like especially when we are talking about uh, video understanding. It's a holistic problem where you need to do spatial temporal reasoning, and uh, we need to be able to factor more cognition concepts into this process, like a causal inference. If something happened, what really caused this thing to happen? Machine learning techniques, uh, mostly deals with like a correlation between data. Okay, correlation and the causality are two totally different concepts there. So, so I feel that also needs to happen. And uh, some of the fundamental problems like uh, learning from small data and uh, even learning from language, potentially we need to address it. Think about how we human are learning. We learn in two ways, learning from experience, but there is a lot of fact that we learn from language. For example, while we are Talking with each other, indeed, uh, similarly through language, I've already learned a lot from you. 
for example. That, and that. I, you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a very compact information flow. We are now centrally focused on deep learning. Uh, if we look back uh, like uh, 10, 15 years ago, you see the the computer vision community is more diverse. You see all kinds of machine learning methods. You see all kinds of knowledge borrowed from physics, from optical field, uh, all getting into this field to try to tackle the problem from multi-perspective. As we are emphasizing diversity everywhere, I think the scientific community is going to be more healthy if we have diverse perspective and tackling the problem from multiple perspective. You know, that's great advice because mm -hmm. as the community welcomes new researchers, they want to have big thinkers, broad thinkers, right. divergent thinkers mm -hmm. to sort of push for the next big breakthrough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gang Hua, thank you for coming in. It's been really illuminating and um, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much. To learn more about Dr. Gang Hua and the amazing advances in computer vision, visit microsoft.com research.